So I'm going to do a quick intro about the um, about PFLA and the work the work that we're doing, um, and then I've also just to sort of introduce so you know who's coming up. Um, the next will be Sam. Sam, do you want, would like to give people a wave? Hi. That's Sam. Um, and then we have Danny. Hi, Danny. Oh, hello. Oh. Um, then we have um, Nick, and um, then followed by Gary. Hello. So really good team of really practical, grounded um, people who are doing real work on the ground. Um, and uh, that's um, lovely uh, to have you with us. So it's, it will be um, pleased to hear about what you're doing. And thanks for all those who are contributing to the chat. This is a normal Zoom session meeting. So um, we would rather than a webinar session and we would therefore ask you to keep your microphones on mute. Um, during the session. Um, if we're going to be recording the session, we are recording the session. If you don't want to be seen, um, then keep, turn your camera off um, and um, we will, um, the recording will be available on the conference website afterwards. Um, so yeah, I think without further ado, um, and if people have got specific tech queries, please do message Rachel. Um, so it's Rachel Marshall, and um, you can send her a direct message via the chat function as well. Um, so yes, so um, welcome, welcome to this um, Pasture um, for Life session. So the Pasture Fed Livestock Association, known as PFLA, is now 10 years old. It has over 600 members. And it's been really growing over the last 10 years. So those who go to the Oxford Real Farming Conference will have seen it's had a growing presence there. And it's, it's amazing to see the ideas evolve. And I've, I've been a member probably for sort of four, five, six years now. Um, and it's a really, a lot of people have been on a journey as they've become members, and we certainly have as a farm. Um, and it's, it's great to see the organisation supporting people on the ground and thinking very, very hard about how it can best do that going forward. And um, what we're particularly here Today we want to share with you some of our ideas about regional groups um, and how we can ensure that people in different regions of the country are effectively supported. And thanks to the Princess Countryside Fund, we've had some funding which has helped um, us set up a sort of emerging group in, particularly in Cumbria, but um, which Sam has been um, leading on. And now with additional funding that's coming forward um, from Esme Fairburn, I believe that's right, Jimmy, isn't it? Um, yeah, we've um, really appreciative of the support to enable us to take forward um, this work. And it's really important that we acknowledge the support of organisations and funders that are helping us to do this. So in terms of the regional approach and what we're, we're seeking to do through this, is firstly, when you have a large organisation, and particularly in the north, you might think everything relating to sort of pasture fed happens in Devon and Cornwall because they get an awful lot of publicity and we, we're sort of, maybe we're, we're catching up now, but it's a long way to go to Devon for events in Cornwall. Um, but we're, we're really pleased to see a growing interest in the north of England. And what we recognise is that our situation here is, is significantly different due to um, the different markets available for our are produced due to the soils, due to the weather, the shorter growing season. And also it's lovely to be able to connect directly with people doing, doing work who live, live not too far away from one is doing sim with similar ambitions. So that's making our national organisation relevant is the first aim. The second aim is how do we actually build together the supply chain? So you might be on a hill farm where you can grow um, store lambs or store cattle, but actually you can't finish and you need to find someone nearby you can connect to it. It might be you want to connect with a butcher or a restaurant um, and, and making sure we can feed in to connect everybody together. Um, and then finally, what we want to do is make sure we get that peer-to-peer -peer, um, exchange of knowledge, um, of experience, and what we know is that the situations here are significantly, in, in the north, are different, and we need to be responsive. We also have a, you know, a lot of national parks, we have a lot of SSSI designation, there are lots of things that we need to consider in our particular situation. And um, we're just, um, you know, going through the process of building up the staff to, to make this a reality 
um, and um, we'd like to, this is a really one of the early opportunities to get, get all other organisations involved, uh, other people involved in our, um, how we take this forward. So we're very keen to learn a bit about your views about what we're doing and how we can facilitate um, the growth of regenerative agricultural grass fed systems. Um, so really my main aim is to, as the chair, is to encourage you to sort of listen and hear from the lived experience of a number of farmers um, and that's going to be the, the purpose of today. But what we should also say among our 600 members, it's only about, um, it's le less than a fifth, about 20% who are certified. I think Jimmy would be about right. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Yeah. So what we know is that we're all on a journey and for some people being certified is their, their target. For others, it's not. They're simply seeking to improve their, their practices, make the best of the assets that they've got. And so it, it's not, we, lots of people join and they don't have the intention of becoming certified, um, but they, they may in due course or they may not. And that's absolutely fine. We're keen on sharing experience and knowledge from people, whether they plan to certify or not. Um, so yes, anything about, um, you know, with questions you've got, we'll be keeping an idea, uh, an eye on the chat and we'll have opportunities for that. We'll also later on have a, a short breakout session so you can share some ideas um, with, um, with other participants because we don't have that sort of coffee break, the opportunity to chat to the person next to you that you would do in a face-to-face -face conference. We're really keen to, to build a community through, through putting you into smaller groups. So on that note, I'd really like to hand now hand over to Sam, who's been at the forefront of creating, facilitating the coming together. And Sam lives it as well as facilitates. So um, Sam, over to you. Right. So I, I'll start, I'll share my screen now so people can see the slides that I've got. Um, so hopefully that's all working. Um, so I stuck, these are actually two photos of your farm, Julia. I don't know if you want to speak about them at all, but. Um, well, I could very briefly yeah. um, say, so these are our, our lambs, this year's lambs. This is the first year we've used electric fencing. This is a herbalay we sowed under our stewardship scheme. It used to be in an arable with a green manure um, rotation and um, we put in a herbal lay. It's done really well this summer and um, the lambs were finishing lambs on this. Um, we've had the cattle in here before and it's a bit shorter. This is in the Eden Valley so literally as you go over past the trees there's the Eden Va River Eden at the bottom. Great swimming in case that um, you're, you're interested um, and you can look across to the North Pennines. Um, so moving on to the next slide at the other end of the field. This is the, the sort of taller herbal lay where the cattle are still in there and um, we've, um, this is the second time they've been through this field this summer. Um, so these are our longhorn cattle and they're, they're being grazed in strips. So they've literally come out of this this morning and they're now doing some more conservation grazing um, in, a, in a wooded bit, a sort of wood pasture bit of land on the farm just sort of over down towards the river. So thanks, Sam. Right, okay. So, oh, I've just missed a slide there. So this is, uh, this is where I farm. So um, this is Galbra, which is um, next to Oldswater. So this is, the, this is looking over at the farm from the top of Helen Fell. Um, and I've been here for uh, about three years now. It's my wife's family farm. Um, so she grew up here um, and her granddad um, used to farm it. Um, he had uh, about six or seven hundred Swaledale ewes and about 80 or 90 Angus um, cattle. Um, but unfortunately he, he passed away in the late 90s um, and since then um, the family went over to, to, to grass letting the whole farm um, on annual kind of grazing licenses. Um, and yeah, I met, I met Claire, um, and, um, we, I, I had a background in farming because my, my parents had sheep down in Derbyshire. Um, as you can tell by my accent, I'm not from Cumbria. I actually originate from Swindon. Um, 
spent a bit of time in Bristol and also Portsmouth and lived quite a suburban life until I kind of met Claire and decided to uh, be a farmer in Cumbria. So yeah, I, I, I'm coming at farming from a sort of new angle, I suppose. Um, and th this, so, so this photo sort of shows the kind of range of habitats that we have at Galbra. Um, we've got top fell, um, we've got commercial forestry plantation. Um, in the middle, it's kind of wood pasture, woodland, rough grazing. And then down by the lake, um, we've got, yeah, meadows, um, basically. So this next photo kind of is a, is, is a sort of step on my journey, I suppose, towards regenerative farming. Um, in the, when, so when I moved here, obviously didn't know anyone. I had to, to try and get out and learn from other farmers and meet as many people as I could. So I joined the Farmer Network, Cumbria Farmer Network, which was great. And I went along to a few visits and things. And somehow in a roundabout way, I, I heard about the PFLA and I just, I found that very interesting. So I joined as a member and then I became the Cumbrian Upland Group Coordinator. And this photo shows the first um, event that I organized um, for the PFLA. And it was actually at Nicola Renaissance Farm, Paul and Nicola Renaissance Farm. Nicola will probably recognize the, the field that we're standing in. The weather was, of course, uh, horrendous uh, on the day. Um, but in the in the background, you can see a mob of about 600 youths. I think they were in a sort of two acre paddock and they were being moved every day. And I just thought this was really, really interesting. Um, and yeah, we yeah, had a great time. And that's Gary Miller there too in the photo on the right hand side. So, so that's good. Um, and so fast forward to kind of now, um, this shows kind of what I've been doing for most of the summer, which is setting out electric fencing and moving cattle. Um, I picked up a few tips from, um, from not only the Renaissance, but also people like the Brewster brothers up in Scotland. Um, they, I, I got a 50 mil bit of blue pipe and I stuck it to the front of the quad bike. It means I can drive all over the electric fencing without switching it off which is brilliant. And then I went on YouTube and I've, I've been looking at Greg Judy videos and things like that. And I just, I've adapted the quad bike now to, to help me. Basically it's a one man job now to do fencing and I can just do it really quickly. Uh, and it just works really, really well. Um, so yeah, we had, so about 12 months ago, we, we started a joint venture with Wilderculture, which is a community interest company. And it's a, we're, we're trying a hybrid between rewilding and regenerative agriculture on our farm. So essentially we are, we're using a large bank of deferred grazing for the winter um, to, to feed the cattle during the winter. And during the summer, we're using mob grazing, letting the grass grow as long as we can, um, ideally letting it all go to seed if we can. Um, and then yeah, moving them every well, every day, we've been moving kind of every day for the last few months. Um, and we've seen some amazing growth rates um, from this. I've been weighing the cattle a lot. Um, we managed to finish a 25 month old bullock. Um, and he was 650 kilograms live weight, um, slightly too fat, which was perfect because we're selling beef direct. So we, we need a good fat cover um, and yeah, he was growing at two kilograms a day for the last few months. So I think it's pretty impressive what we can do. And we've, so we've managed to, to finish now that's four, um, what we've done under 30 months. And we are, of course, pasture fed certified. We're the second farm in Cumbria to be certified pasture fed. And at the moment, the only farm in the Lake District. Um, so hopefully there'll be other people looking to go down this route in future. Um, so yeah, with the with the Cumbrian Upland Group, I guess I um, I had some some success really in getting lots of people to that first event, even though the weather was kind of horrible. Um, and then after that, I did a a number of kind of um, seminars, discussions, and um, I wanted to do more farm visits, but of course, coronavirus kind of 
came along and made it a bit more difficult. Um, yeah, we had, you know, th there were some positive things, certainly. Um, you know, people like Gary have come along and I think it's great um, to, to kind of get, get people thinking differently, really. Um, but I always felt like maybe it's because I'm from Swindon, um, but people maybe think I'm a bit of a loony. Um, and it would be great to get more of a kind of traditional kind of uh, uh, sort of fell farmers to, to come along to these types of events and try and get them thinking um, differently, I guess. Um, that was kind of everything that I had to say to sort of introduce myself. So I'll hand over to, um, to Danny now. That's all right. Are you there, Danny? I am. Thank you very much. Good. All right. I'll... Yeah, my name's Danny Teasdale. Thank you very much, Sam. My name's Danny Teasdale, and I run a, uh, a non-for-profit community interest company in the Ullswater area. So I've just started to do a little bit of a background on that, how that got set up, and then some other things that that uh, that I do. So. My family's lived in the sort of Ullswater area for generations now. Um, I've lived in the area all my life as well. The family used to farm. We don't anymore. We let the land off. And I've always managed the land for conservation. And it's, I've always thought, I've always found it important to see it from both sides. So, and to show how the conservation can fit into the farming. And I set the CIC up to show that we can have sustainable farming, we can have natural flood management, we can have nature recovery and they can all coincide really nicely with each other. I live in Glenridin and in 2015 uh, Storm Desmond came through and flooded a place called massive damage, homes, businesses flooded, livestock drowned, fences, walls washed out. It was just a horrendous, horrendous time for everybody. So there were several of us set up a local flood action group and with my background in countryside we agreed that I would look into upland management, different land use, see if we could build a more flood resilient catchment um, through working with the farmers as well, government organisations, that sort of thing, to see what we could do. It was essentially, it's a facilitation role, that's what it was working with the farmers, getting people to show me ideas and then see how we could we could put that into sort of practice and make things work and see see what we could actually come up with. And it worked really well that that working with farmers, that farmer led approach from the ground up. People seemed to like it. And so I expanded the area, the working area to not just Glenridden and Patterdale. It was initially based into to spread that right round Ullswater and then and then the surrounding areas. But I couldn't get any funding as Danny Teasdale. So I set up the community interest company to put us in a position to be able to apply for grants and for funding. But one thing that I wanted to do right from the start was to work with the farmers. I live in the area, I know people, I go to the pub with them, you know, we all know each other, but I wanted them to be a part of this. And so I set up a, a farm steering group just from very, very early on, just an opportunity for people to come together. We can bring in speakers, we can have discussions, we can share ideas. And as much as anything, these, these events turn into a, a social event. We'll go to a pub, we'll have a bit of food, we'll have a drink, we'll put a speaker on. But it's somewhere where people can safely and comfortably discuss ideas we can throw things around and we can share what works and to that extent Natural England asked me to apply for a facilitation uh, to apply for the facilitation fund through them to create a formalized facilitation group I was successful in it and we got it and signing up people really nice and it's it's a great idea in principle, the facilitation fund through Natural England, but I do think it is deeply flawed with it being run through Natural England and now RPA, there's all sorts of issues with it. 
Great idea. Bring four together. Yes, Natural England covers my costs. Yes, they do cover venue costs, refreshments. But the first big problem that I encountered was I didn't get paid for six months. It comes back to the Natural England sort of point where it's a really good idea and it could be really, really good. But no one's going to work for free. And I think if they could just cut through some of the bureaucracy on this and they could simplify this system, we could end up with a really, really good idea where we're bringing groups of farmers together, we're discussing these ideas, but lose the whole bureaucratic process. I think to the application process for myself to apply for that was 21 pages long. It absolutely just does not need to be that soul destroying. And to be fair, I even nearly launched it in the bin a few times myself because I was just struggling with it. I think if if you had groups like ours, the funds were more were either up front or more forthcoming, definitely, definitely easier to access and simplify. The work that you can do is is phenomenal. Once people are coming together and they're all sharing different ideas from the spectrum that they're on, you make such a massive difference. One of the things I do want to do, and, and Sam touched on it before as well is once we're allowed to with COVID restrictions, is to start to have some more walkovers and bring the group together, have a look around. And it's far easier to describe and discuss the whole sort of farming situation, the whole regenerative side of it, to maybe some of the more typical bigger fell guys and what have you and show them and absolutely just take them on the ground, show them what it's like, show them what it's like, and show how much grass is on there, how much life is there and what's actually possible. I do think that, um, that, the, way that the, the way the farming's going and the way that the whole subsidy support system, et cetera, et cetera, is going, that this working together is gonna be the way forward. And we do need to sort of try and work on this, uh, this, this format where we can come together, share ideas, and then I think this is where the the regenerative, the you know, it, it's all part of the sustainable agriculture. It's a good story, and I think people can can move with that. So I've witted on long enough. That's that's me. I think. Thank you. Thank you very much, Danny. Um, and here's a picture of Danny running a session with um, with farmers in the, um, Matterdale, um, actually at James's, isn't it? Is yeah yeah so James Rebanks is place that one. Yeah. It, not just there, it can be the pub, but yeah, James is really supportive of the whole idea as well, and he can bring in speakers as well. So yeah, so this is an education James built as part of you know with with support from he built a sort of education centre, and it's in the sort of side of his barn. So his sheep shed is literally sort of the other side of the wall, and it's I think how we facilitate having the right facilities and the right places. For facilitating is really important um, and it's it's fantastic to see the work that that Danny is is doing here and um, and making things happen so but as, as Danny says it is challenging as an individual um, to try and try and make this happen and how we move forward and can enhance um, opportunities for facilitation and that's great that um, PFLA is going to be able to directly support some of this facilitation work as well um, and, and Danny's got doing lots of great work all over the place he's um, I mean also working with Danny on another project called the, the Real Hedge Fund and where again that's an opportunity to encourage farmers to bring um, to enhance hedgerows on their holdings and um, so um, you know I just want to say thanks for Danny giving up the time today. He's incredibly busy um, most of his time, quite rightly, outside doing real work. So uh, if you've got any questions for Danny or Sam, please do um, put them in the chat and we'll be collating those questions. Um, and I think it's how we bring together opportunities for conservation, opportunities for food production um, on on the farm and that's you know Sam was very neatly explaining that it's not an either or it's a both and is really what we're we're about. Um, I'd like now to um, hand over first to um, Nicola Renison. Um, Nicola are you um, here's a um, able to sort of take over now? Yep yep 
Um, yep. Would you like to introduce yourself a bit? You again, a bit like me, have a number of hats and um, yeah. No, so about. yeah. Well, I'm I'm Nick, and um, I farm um, at Callihoof at, at Rennick near Penrith on the camp edge of the Pennines with my husband Paul and our two kids. Um, but I also work for AHDB as a knowledge exchange manager um, for Beef and Lamb. So I've kind of on this subject, I've got my my foot in two camps really. So I facilitate, but we also farm. So. I'll explain a bit about what discussion groups have done for us on our farm and then I will go on to to my kind of work. So we moved here in 2012, it's 350 acres of kind of upland pasture land I suppose. Um, and when we started we were quite conventional in our thinking and then we started to get a little bit interested in grass and we didn't know much about grass at that point. And we formed a local discussion group just, just by ourselves, just a group of farmers. And we started talking um, about grass a lot, quite sadly so really. And um, this led us to visit some farmers in Northumberland called the Nellis Brothers. And they farm on a relatively big scale. It's very mixed. They've got sheep, cattle, pigs, poultry. But everything that they do is in a rotation. And they lamb outside, they carve outside. And the most important thing is that they're profitable. And, and for us, this was a real game changer. And I can remember Renault coming back from there saying, we're going to do this. Uh, so from that point, everything has been in a rotation. Um, to begin with, we had a lot to learn um, and it hasn't all been plain sailing. So apart from lambing time, when we do set stock for about two and a half months, everything else, we're always in a rotation and moving every one or every two days. But it hasn't always been plain sailing. To begin with, back in 2014, we, we had Swaledales. Now, if you put Swaledales in a small area um, with walls and electric fence, they just jump over the fence or get tied up in, in the wire. So it, ha it hasn't all been easy, but we've persevered. And so we, we then decided that we needed to improve our electric fencing around the farm. So we've got all the wa walls have now have a hot wire with mains electric around. Um, so we can then subdivide off them. Um, we've got water, we, we have invested quite a bit of money in, in infrastructure as far as water tanks and um, that kind of thing. But, but in, in the scheme of it, not very much money in comparison to some machinery you might, you might buy when you're farming. So by managing the grass like this, anyone has, that has done this will know, you then grow more grass. So we did the kind of farmer thing, we've got more grass, we need more sheep. So, um, so we upped our sheep numbers and then in 2015 we lambed that year we lambed over a thousand sheep and this is when we we came kind of unstuck we just had sheep there were some dairy heifers growing in the sheds but on the grassland it was predominantly sheep so then we um we had a big worm burden lambs didn't grow very well um alongside a trace element problem we kind of had the year from hell i suppose and then we we had we had grown lots of grass been successful at that but we had created a monoculture of sheep i think and nature doesn't like monocultures so we started reducing our sheep numbers and building up a suckler cow enterprise and then so we, we got to the stage in 2020 where we've last this, this year just gone we've um we lambed 500 sheep and we've carved 40 sucklers next year it's likely to be 350 sheep and maybe 60 sucklers so why do we do this and why have we gone through all this pain and had to learn all this stuff and the, the basic reason is money sadly enough um, and, and is it profitable and I would say yes for us and I can't speak for anyone else but for us it is and the reason it is is because we don't use any fertilizer we don't use any feed um, all our lambs are gone by the end of August be it store or fat um, and the biggest important thing for us is our whole year is is governed by grass growth so we want the lambs gone so we can build up this wedge for the winter um the cattle are housed for the shortest time possible young stock are outside on bale pods and although we aren't organic we farm kind of organically alongside this the genetics we kind of chased our, our sheep breeds so now we have um, Aberdeen Anguses and an Aberfield cross Clin U. So everything is from a very maternal base and designed to live outside. Um, where am I? Where am I? So alongside the discussion group and a visit to the analysis, what else has inspired us to change? We'll go, I've already said this a little bit, but money, it's, it's the margin 
we're, we're not we don't think about individually high prices and we don't really want our name in the paper but we've got a, a really huge mortgage and we need to um generate enough money to to to, hand, to to deal with that so my question may be to um to you all is if we hadn't have had that financial pinch would it have led us down that path um can we go on to the next slide So one of my mottos is that every day is a school day and we've had to think very differently about things and we've, um, we try lots of different things and sometimes we have a complete utter disaster but when things work well it's good to, to share it with people and even when things obviously don't work well that's probably the more important time to share with people. So within my, um, my job with, with AHDB I did prior to COVID I do lots of farmer meetings on farm and when when you're facilitating a farmer meeting when it's when it goes well it's absolutely the best job in the world so standing in a field like we are here um talking to a bunch of farmers and it can be um what may, might seem slightly dull subject to other people that aren't in this kind of thing but just deciding about which electric fence post to use or the best ways to plant a hedge or maybe some outwintering or how if a herbal lay has worked well it's kind of um it, you can see everything sinking in with these farmers and it really really it, it's just a fantastic um, arena to learn in so I personally like quite small groups maybe less than 10 when um, and any question doesn't matter no question is too daft really and it's a very inclusive um, place to learn um, and also to remember that everyone in in that group is on a different journey so some people might be just starting to rotationally graze some people might say actually i don't want to say anything today i just want to come here and listen and even if you just this one seed is dropped that they they're just starting to think differently then that's a success in my in my eyes so i think to kind of wrap it up in the uplands we have got an amazing opportunity to grow largely grass-fed protein which is which is in, in a way that holds is, is great for water holding um, and we can manage the land if we graze the land slightly differently we could we can just manage it better for wildlife for biodiversity and most importantly make money um, and can i just mention a tiny bit one minute about carbon calling um, so Tim Nicholson, who's also on the call, along with my husband, Reno, and um, Liz Jennifer, who's a mate of mine, next June, it was due to happen in August, but next June, we are holding um, a, a regenerative conference in uh, Kirby Thor on the A66 on a farm. And uh, Joel Salton's our main speaker, but it's just a very farmer grassroots conference. All the speakers will predominantly be farmers. So it's very much farmers talking to farmers. It'll be very relaxed and casual and um, yeah, I hope you all can come. And that's it. Thank you very much, Nick. It's lovely to have you with us. And, um, and Nick is brilliant at organizing events. So I have been to an HDB event she's organized and it's really great. Um, so any opportunity you have to go to anything Nick's organizing, I highly recommend. Um, now we're gonna hand over to Gary and his team. He's got a whole team here <laughs> today. You. Um, are you um, so right? Are you all right, Gary? Yeah, no problem. I've uh, you'll have to bear with us. I've never done this before. Um, we're all learning. That's right. Um, our farm in Cumbria in the Lake District. Uh, we're just on the edge of the lake district with an upland farm. I'm in partnership with my wife. I've got four kids that are there on the picture. They all help on the farm. And two, two of my daughters are really interested in farming and they've done farming at Newton Rigg College and, and stuff like that. We have um, roughly 200 acres. We rent 100 and we own 100 or the bank owns it. We're paying, trying to pay for it. Um, we have 450 yards that we lamb. It's all grass, our farm. Um, we have 70 or 80 hogs each year that we fetch in. We have some cows. We have 6,000 hens for free range egg production. I'm also a plumber, which I still do a few days a week because the wages are quite good. 
Um, and I, we also have a few pigs and my wife and children ride horses. So we've got a bit going on. Um, our farm, what we've tried, historically we didn't have loads of subsidy because we took the farm over 20 odd years ago and didn't have the historic payments. So we've always focused on profit. We need to make profit. We've got a lot of money borrowed, we need to pay back. Um, what we're trying to do is to increase productivity with less input. Um, we want to, wife, my wife and the girls are big into high welfare. They want everything right. Um, we're trying to improve our soils, the soil structure, fertility, productivity of the soils and, and the whole farm, really. Um, we've always been into wildlife. We like we were on a countryside stewardship scheme um, 20 years, 17 years ago when we first sort of took everything over um, and increased the size of the farm. We've done hedge laying and such like that in the past and are still on with that sort of stuff at the moment. Um, my wife's grandfather always said that we're only looking after the land while we're here. So if we can leave it in a better state than what we took it over in, you know, we're going in the right direction. Um, going on to meetings, um, I think a lot of what, what we've learned over the years is probably from going to these meetings. I go to meetings with Nick Rennison, uh, Danny Teasdale, Sam, HDB meetings, all about catchment management. We're in a vet group, which I think it just encourages you to think about how everything's running, you know, so it's your animal welfare and everything as well. NSA group meetings, Pasture for Life, and I'm in Farmer Network. So the, I, I do, you see a lot of inspiring people um, and a lot of farmers that's probably doing it a lot better than what we're doing it. Um, we're just sort of winging it and learning things as we go along. But if you can pick up ideas from these, these other farmers, there's some fantastic farmers doing some really good jobs. And it... Um, if you can take a bit of that home and just, you know, like Nick said, all your farms are different, but if we can, if we can improve things and just use some of these ideas to, to make our farms better, um, I think it's a really good thing. I think also I'm really keen to have my children involved and, and, you know, they're the future of farming. If they can become part of it and learn some of the stuff that we've learned and some of the stuff that we're learning from other people, I think it's a really good thing. Um, so how we're trying to improve our farm, if you want to go on to the next slide, Sam. We've got land here. We've got three different blocks of land because we've got some at Watermillock, not far from Sam. And we've got land here at Penruddock, which is um, split by the A66, really. So we end up running three flocks of sheep because moving them isn't it isn't it isn't easy with the a66 you have to trail everything across really because it's too busy to run sheep across um we've always done a bit of rotational grazing when i first had a field i had five acres where i used to live at skelton one of the first things i did uh, this is going back in the late 80s i put a fence through the middle of the field and split it so that we could rotate sheep back and forward now i think that was our start of rotational grazing which you know, for a long time, I thought I was probably doing a good job. And yes, it was better than just having them set stock, but it wasn't really a good job when you get into more, you know, looking at how, how you could improve things. Um, we've probably been at um, fault of overgrazing in the past. Um, probably, like Nick says, probably keeping too many sheep. Um, we'll have a good year and, and you maybe keep a few more and then you have a, a bad year or it's a bad lambing time or something, you keep a few less. About 450 is sort of right for us. We've kind of gone out of cows a little bit because I think there were some cows selling, we were selling cows and calves and we were having a good trade for a few years there, but it hasn't been just as good. We've reduced our cows right down and I think in the future we'll probably go for a more traditional breed with lower inputs. Um, if you want to move on to the next slide, please, Sam. Um, this is what I, I like our grass to look like now when we're moving sheep. Um, these last two years, we've really got into rotational grazing. I think we've kind of tried to prove to ourselves that we can do it. We haven't bought electric fence yet, although I was at a meeting with Nick Rennison the other day, and um, 
seen Richard Carruthers with his electric fences and we've got a list and we're going to order some electric fences for this next year. But what we've done so far is um, bunch our sheep up after lambing time into between 100 and 150 yows in each bunch. Um, some of the fields are very small, three quarters of an acre to maybe an acre. The, the, we try to have long grass like this, like Sam was saying, you know, the longer the better. In the past we've worried about grass going to seed or it getting too long and it possibly being wasted. We don't worry about that anymore if it gets trampled in or if it gets uh, muck on it or whatever. It, it'll stand itself back up and we'll graze it the next time round. Um, some of the fields, you know, we've had to sort of mix and match our way of grazing. Some fields the sheep will be in maybe even just from the morning till night. Other fields they'll be in for 24 hours. Some of the bigger fields, like our biggest field on the farm is nine acres. So even, you know, with the bigger fields it'll work better with, with electric fences, but we might leave them in three or four days to eat fields off. Uh, we try to have a long rest before they go back into the field. Um, to try to to try to make the uh, it really is we've called it rotational grazing in the past but i think working towards regenerative grazing is the way to go it really it, it does make a difference we've looked at flock health planning we're planning more with the electric fences what we're going to do we've improved genetics in his tups and maternal sires we're trying to run a closed flock now rather than buying in meal gimmer lambs and stuff like that We've improved our hedges, we've laid hedges, coppiced hedges, planted new hedges up. Um, we've done this because, well, I like to see more wildlife. If you see more red squirrels, curlews, all that sort of thing on your land, it, it's fantastic. Um, things like that have been in de decline and we haven't really thought about it in the past, but it's coming, you know, everybody's thinking about it more now. You've kind of until you actually start looking at it, you don't realise how much everything's um, declined. Hedgehogs, butterflies, all sorts of things, you know, if we can encourage them, I think we're doing a good job. We've, we've worked with, uh, we've been on the Hedgehogs and Boundaries scheme with the Countryside Stewardship Scheme. Um, Danny, with the Ullswater Catchment Management, they've put in more trees we've planted some new hedges and such like woodland trust for supplying trees volunteers have been helping it's, it's fantastic to have people helping and doing things like that so to answer what i was sort of saying before um we wanted to prove to ourselves you know can it work without the electric fences without spending a lot and and, and loads of inputs um yes it can there's advantage the advantages are fantastic we can grow so much more grass the, everything's more resilient. Um, our soil structure, I think, is improving. In spring, we had two, three months where it was really dry. Yes, we were shorter grass. It wasn't. It wasn't the length of the grass that's on the picture that you're looking at there. But we we never ran out of grass. We were moving sheep, and you were feeling like you were moving them just to change the view. But it wasn't. It, it was. It was working. It, you know. The, we still kept moisture in the ground when it was dry and then on the flip side of that in the wet times i think our ground is actually staying dr drier in the wet times because of the way we're grazing it now it um, in the past i always sort of used to notice that we our ground ground really dried out in the summer you could hardly knock post, posts in when you're fencing and stuff like that um, and in the winter it was really really wet well when you're grazing it down to an inch long all the time and then only letting it grow to two or three inches before you put stock back in it, it didn't get chance now that it's got that cover on the ground everything's so much so much better we've got more species of grass we've got more species of flowers and stuff there's more insects moths hedgehogs frogs and toads the kids my daughter has an instagram page and she puts pictures on of wildlife and all sorts of stuff that's that's there that wasn't really there before so I think that's doing a good job um, we've got lots of room for improvement Nick and lots of other people they're, do, they're doing fantastic jobs and we're just sort of playing catch up really but hopefully hopefully you know electric I think if we buy electric fences and get into that next year then bigger fields that we haven't been able to graze right we can split them up and do a better job of that but I think it, it all is 
um, it all is going in the right direction and I think it's a, a really good way to do things. Um, disadvantages. I did want to say the disadvantages because it's not all plain sailing. Um, if you want to move on to the next slide, please, Sam. This is us moving some of our yows and lambs through the village. This was a bunch of yows. I think there was 150 yows here with twin lambs. Um, it's a big job when you're moving. I've got good sheep dogs and I've got four kids, but you do kind of need them when you're moving through the village like this. And you've got a long line, like the sheep go up that road as far as you can see. And it's a long way back to where the kids are on the quad bike behind them. Um, it still does work. We can, you know, we've got lots of spread out fields. If all of the fields was in a block and we just had to move them from one to the other, it would be easier, but we still can get away with it. You know, so it's a, it is a disadvantage. The other disadvantage, our sheep pens aren't big enough. Our sheep pens are made for handling 40 or 50 yards with the lambs and big numbers like this. It isn't as easy, but it's all workable. We split the sheep up, put them in a paddock next to the sheep pens and then work through them. So it all, it all works. Um, Worm burdens on your lambs, I think, need watching. You know, I think, um, I think to be on top of your sheep w with any system, you need to be, you need attention to detail, and it all needs to work well. We do fecal egg counting um, to make sure we're dosing them at the right time, but it is something that you really need to keep on top of because, like Nick said, you maybe do get a build up of a worm burden, but I think also. They're rotating them around lots of fields, so you know they're not getting back into them fields just as soon. You can keep it works okay. You can keep you can keep your sheep moving, and yes, there is a worm challenge, but it's not anything that, anything that's that's really bad. Um, I, sh I think sheep in the past have had a lot of bad press, and there's lots of people that think, well, you can't do rotational grazing or regenerative grazing with sheep. I disagree with that because I think you can do it. I think you just need to be doing it in the right way. Um, and the way that it's worked for us this year, we've had more grass than we've ever had. I know we've a few less cattle, but you know, when you're only talking of six or eight cows, it, it doesn't make a hell of a difference to us that we've always been more of a sheep farm. Um, and it, it still is working really well. We, our winters probably don't work as good because a lot of our rented ground we don't have from the 1st of January until the 1st of April. So it does get tightened up onto our own fields and they possibly do get overgrazed. But we put some sheep inside. Um, we try not to winter them away because we like to be looking after them ourselves rather than letting somebody else look after them. Um, so another, another um, disadvantage is the next slide, please, Sam. Um, we usually make 300 round bales every year this year we've made 400 and we've still got more grass than we've ever had going into winter so if anybody wants to buy some round bales we've got some to sell this time that's not a disadvantage is it i don't think it's a disadvantage but i just i just wanted to in the future we'll probably have less you know we'll not make as many bales we'll try to leave that cover on the fields more for coming into the winter and graze it off the field rather than the round bales which is which is a far better way because we're not, um, it's not the plastic, it's not the cost of making round bales, everything else. Oh, Gary, um, could you just wrap up, do you think, just so we that's can... That's me finished now. Up. The only other thing I wanted to say was, my wife's grandfather always, always used to say as well, you should never worry about having too much grass. It's just when you haven't got enough that you should be worrying. So that's me finished, thank you. That's absolutely brilliant, Gary. And I think it's so important to, to hear the pros and the cons and the journey. And I think that's something absolutely all of us who are, who are farming, you know, look, looking at regenerative techniques, find we are on a long and I think continuing and a lifelong journey. Um, you, never, you never get there. It is, um, it is the, the traveling rather than the destination that we're on. Now there have been a range, I've been keeping a um, really good conversation going on in the chat. Um, and I just wanted to pick up on a few things um, that have come up um, through the chat and maybe put these to, to some of our speakers. So um, one of the, quite a lot about comparing um, how estab both establishing herbal lays and comparing sort of out, both outputs in terms of finishing, but also in terms of biodiversity. And, and I know my experience is that our, our traditional pastures and our biodiverse rich hay meadows that are in say high level stewardship, those are 
have a lot of biodiversity, but it's a completely different biodiversity to what's in the herbal A, which is pr primarily a diversity to help um, uh, help an agricultural as well as carbon storage. So they 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 can both be biodiverse, but are both different. But I I was going to ask Nick whether you had any comments on the sort of herbal A and the, the the benefits, and you know clearly you have to you may have to plow to put them in and and what you see. Yeah, we we have. Um direct drilled herbal lays successfully mm. with, without ploughing and that's been good you, ha you do have to use glyphosate for that we i think we used a half measure um but we, we've got a mixture of we've inherited rye grass just traditional one uh, improved rye grass pastures um we've got a, 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 some unimproved pastures but i think this type of grazing benefits both but what we do do to increase um, the the d diversity in in our uh, kind of more plainer pastures, you might say, with full of ryegrass, is um, Reno has a fiddle drill that he fills up, and when the cows or the sheep have been in in a paddock, he um, go, walks up and down with his fiddle drill and spreads plantain chicory, um, and that is his um, very frugal way of, um, uh, of getting new stuff in in the mix. Um, but and, and also Coxfoot on our old pastures, Coxfoot just responds really well to this type of grazing. Um, yeah. So that answers it. Yeah, the actual grazing, the way you graze can also improve the biodiversity. Yeah, I um, think so. Yeah, we've also found that we feed in the fields, so we have some hard standings mm -hmm. and then we also move things around. So we take biodiverse um hay or haylage from one taken off one pasture and feed it somewhere else, and that's really helps the following year. Um, improved yeah. clover content quite a lot does um anyone i don't know whether um sam or gary want to say anything about their pastures and um particularly sort of any notice anything they've noticed i mean gary you said a bit already about biodiversity within that is have you well, got any I'll, uh, can i just say a few years ago before i um before i thought plowing and reseeding was a bad idea uh, we did plow and reseed some fields and I used to be in a, a group that had a forage competition. We made round bales from our old meadow pastures that's got loads of different species in it, and they haven't been, they've still, they've still got furrows in from when they ploughed with horses, so the, the, the pasture, pasture from, you know, permanent pasture from a long time ago. <coughs> um, we compared them with our brand new um, high ryegrass, high sugar, loads of clover, all this sort of stuff. When we got them analysed, our our old pastures were analysing at near enough the same as the new ones. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I, from my experience, I I don't think I think the herbal layers and everything like that's a different thing. But um, I didn't I didn't think that it really. We'd spent a lot of money. We had problems with dockings and thistles and all that sort of stuff after we'd reseeded, and um, it didn't give us the advantage that it was that I was hoping it would give us. You know, I, I was more pleased with our old permanent pastures pastures than I was with the new ones. Thanks, Gary. Yeah, Sam, would you like to chip in? Yeah, I mean, I'd agree with what with what Gary said there because I mean, we're, we're we're trying desperately not to reseed things and just let what we the, you know the plants that we have here just let everything go to seed really, uh, and then we're hoping by doing that we're going to get more um, you know without fertile with, with no fertilizer. Um, on the ground, we're hoping that we're going to get more of the sort of um, traditional um, upland species coming back. I mean, in our winter block, which is the area that we kind of rested all summer, we've noticed a huge amount of, uh, of wildflowers that we, we didn't even know what, what, what like we had on the farm. And, you know, they just suddenly appeared this summer. So we're hoping that there'll be a sort of seeding effect from them um, spreading down to the, to the meadows in future. Great. Um, Thank you, Sam. That, that's excellent. We're going to um, actually, we want to, we've got a, a half an hour left of this session. What we wanted to do is to put you into some, some sort of breakout, a breakout session. Um, we'll come back and deal with some more questions, but um, we just wanted to have an opportunity to split you up and for you to talk with each other a little bit about um, what your, um, have we got the, Jimmy, can you, have you pasting the question in? I'll pop something in now, yeah. <clears throat> um, so we're particularly interested in how, you know, as we're setting up this regional group, how we can support um, 
you doing in, in that process and what support you would like. Um, so that's particularly what's the gaps in terms of knowledge? How can we help you farm better? And particularly, obviously, we know BPS is phasing out from, from next year. There are huge challenges over the next eight or nine years. And we really want to be there to support you in the best possible way. Um, so we're going to be, um, Rachel's going to kindly put us into groups of three or four and then we'll have a quick opportunity for some, some feedback at the end, but we can also put your feedback in the chat. We save all the chat and we'll be, be using that. So the question that Jimmy's typed in the chat is, how can PFLA support farmer to farmer education, learning, I tend to avoid the word education, as well as develop local resilient supply chains through these regional groups. So we'll give you about sort of seven minutes in a breakout session and then we'll come back um, and, uh, and share our ideas around that. Um, has anybody got any queries before we um, press, um, press split? If you haven't been in a breakout room before, please don't worry about it. If what will happen is a little message on the screen will say, join something like breakout, breakout room four or three. You just press join and you will automatically be moved into that. And at the end of the five to seven minutes, you will all, you'll be given a one minute warning and you'll automatically be back, brought back to, to this group. Um, and when you chat, the chat function in the breakout room is only is seen within your breakout room. So it's quite fun. Um, good opportunity to have a little bit of um, uh, more nu nuanced um, conversation. So Rachel, are we? Are you happy to go, ready to go? Yeah, we're ready to go. I just thought that Jane Cooper says she's got no microphone, so she can only communicate through the chat. So hopefully, in your breakout room, there, I'll be understanding and let you type away in response. Welcome back, everybody. Um, that's absolutely lovely to have you with us. Um, what would be really great is to have a little bit of feedback if um, if anybody wanted from their group wanted to nominate. We didn't tell you to seek a sort of something to nominate, but if anybody would like to either raise their hand um, or um, just sort of wave at me. Um, at the moment, I I think if people raise their hand, I can see it and the participants thing. If they want to wave at me, I've got one screen um so who's um jimmy are you yeah I, I'll, I'll say something hi i'm jimmy woodrow from the pfla we had a we had an interesting breakout group of four um of whom none of us were farmers and we had a vet and an academic in the group uh both of whom i think were coming at it from a similar position in in the these groups are a really great way for people like vets and academics and others from perhaps outside the direct food and farming um, practitioners to, to, to get access to you know, farmers at the, at the ground, both to learn, <clears throat> to help um, create change in their own professions, um, but also help farmers with what they're doing as well. Um, we also discussed the issue of trust and ensuring that in order to create change and, and to, to make all of this successful, um, you know, these, these groups need to be very supportive and non-threatening. Yes, that, that's, that's a really interesting thing. We had um, one part that came up in our discussion group was that how do we get people very locally? So the work that Danny is you know, doing in a very local area, how does the PFLA not come out as a come across as a bunch of sort of um, slight nutters doing something so um, avant-garde or risky that people don't wish to engage and how do we make this seem as sort of more normal and mainstream rather than um, even though it is different so that people are encouraged to participate how do we actually encourage people to come along to the to the farm walk um, in the first place and I think that's that's absolutely key. So um, that building of that trust. I don't know whether anybody, it's an interesting point, and I don't know whether anybody would like to add in from their experience. Do just shout out if you'd like to add in. A sound can, I, to add can in. I say something? Yeah. So in my, well, we had a little group, there's four of us, um, and we talked a little bit about education. So 
uh, about kind of what is being taught at agricultural colleges at the moment, because it seems like they seem to be teaching how to spray off fields and sort of sort of use big tractors and stuff. But mm. what about soil, like biology, or about doing a broad habitat survey, mm. or, you know, something different? Um, and maybe that's a way. Maybe the PFLA could speak to agricultural colleges. I don't know if this is a good idea, Jimmy, or not, but shut me down uh, maybe um, and maybe they could you know offer to to help um on a module you know teaching in some way maybe getting a guest farmer to go in to speak to the students or get students to go and visit a farmer yeah you know just some ideas that we had really really good uh, ideas um i've got um i'm going to take peter and then samson and then mark shipley Okay, um, we had a very small group um, with no working farmers, but um, two of us um, have little bits of ground. Um, we talked about um, how you'd um, get this farmer to farmer learning in regions where um, there are very few people who do, or that we're aware of that do regenerative um, uh, sort of agriculture types of stuff. And the Northeast is a classic case in point. Um, there are two, the two farmers currently um, PFLA um, uh, certified. Um, fortunately, um, Ruth, my former colleague, um, and um, one of her colleagues are uh, facilitators for groups in the North Pennines, and they have in their budgets um, uh, money to, to do visits out of area, so it would be possible to do visits to other places that are not necessarily in, immediately in the region, and I think that might be helpful. That sounds really good. So, so working with people who were already working on this is, is that sort of, yeah, sound, sounds excellent. Well, I think that's a good point, Jimmy, to, to note, isn't it? How we work with existing farming officers. Yes, absolutely. We're, we're, I mean, we're hoping to work with both people who are already working on this, but also like-minded organizations with, you know, that, that are looking to have greater access and, and, and impact on the ground. So. I think it's all it's all up for collaboration. Thanks. Now, Mark, you had something you'd like you can show the. Uh, yeah, our group was similarly interesting. We actually had Jane um, without the microphone, but she, it was great through the chat. She's a clear ambassador for you up in Orkney, so that was really good. The rest of us had to admit to not being farmers, but we we had a chat about um, farmers markets and the message, but also education came in a bit about how early can we start to talk to people about the real value and the real price of food. I mean, personally for me, I'm excited now that PFLA is rising up uh, with, the, with the sort of moving forward of regen and restorative agriculture, that it's all sort of coming together and there's an organization already there for it. But it's, it's been hard for myself just to track down PFLA and stuff. I found about it in Lincolnshire, just with a friend in permaculture down there. But if we can get education out there uh, a lot earlier for kids, hopefully, people will start to increase their understanding of the value of food. And then if we do it through secondary school as well, and as Sam said, into agricultural colleges, because heaven knows what they teach in there at the moment. A lot of them aren't even teaching agriculture. So, you know, there's a, there's a whole new call for, for relearning to go on and access to the farms would be great as well. So there's a whole lot of stuff, but mainly about education for us, which will hopefully then influence the, the supply chain for the farmers and encourage more farmers to get involved I think that was generally from our group. Thanks, Mark. That's, and I think educate, I'm involved in the sort of, as Newton Rigg is sort of trying, seeking to reinvent himself. And this is something that I'm writing a piece on at the moment, particularly with regard to the Upland Farm at Low Beckside. Now, Nick, you were going, you kind of going to offer the feedback from your group. Yeah. So in our group, we had uh, three farmers and a vicar and a scientist, <laughs> I think. <laughs> but, um, um, it, we had a conversation about tupping time and feeding sheep at tupping time and um, getting through the winter. So I think there's a real need when you start doing this type of um, farming, there's all these nitty gritty questions which um, farmers only will learn from, from other farmers. And it's that conversation and it's trying new things. So I think that is um, important. And I think wider, we, we always need to, to get a bigger audience um, we need to just relate this back to um, profitability and mm. to prove that this this has got legs really and um, yeah I think we always need to because otherwise it will always be a, will always be an odd bunch 
if we don't if we don't talk about money yeah i think that's really key and, and pfla did a number of years ago produce a document saying it can be done and i believe there's a new version coming out is that right Jimmy? hopefully by the end of the year yeah yeah so so demonstrating you know it's not about necessarily the price you get in the ring though that's really good if that's good as well but it is about the profit margin uh, there's also an interesting book a report done called less is more that was um uh i don't know if anyone's seen the work by chris clark and and that's something i'd i'd recommend so encouraging people to take a long hard look at their fine finances and their profitability um is is critical and their um uh you know their, their fixed costs as well as their variable costs i mean we we farm about 150 acres and we don't have a tractor um we have two quad bikes and we bring in you know when we need to make hay and it we bring in a you know someone to do that so making sure you can be really tough on your your costs um is is important with that um so um just think any other groups who would like to feed back we've um, we must have had quite a lot of groups and we've had about three or four Could i can come back from rachel lovely thank you yes yeah, i popped into a group uh with john thorns and hannah fields there's just two of them there so i went to join them and john made a good point about benchmarking and kind of having more a way of collecting the data around many different factors on your farm from like your profitability to your fertilizer or feed use or not use and biodiversity and having like measures that other people could then compare against so that you have something that's kind of across all of the different all of the different farms that allows you to compare these different aspects and understand why it is that someone maybe isn't spending so much money on on one aspect john is that a good was that a good summary yes okay <laughs> good <laughs> um I, I, one thing i want to do i did promise to come back in with some more of the questions that we'd had on the on the chat and there's been quite a little a lot about floristic diversity within um meadows and pastures and there's um and kathy had asked a question further up that peter's just reminded us of um I know we do surveys every year of our our, um, our meadows. I don't know whether, before I sort of chip in with that, whether Sam, you've done anything, um, you're doing surveys that have noticed any change as you've yeah, moved towards? Well, yes, we, so we have, we've started surveying. Um, at the moment, we have quite a disappointing lack of diversity in the meadows. Um, that's probably due to historic um, basically repeatedly cutting grass in June before everything's gone to seed and then artificial fertilizer. So, but we're hoping by not cutting, basically by uh, reducing down the amount of hay that we're, we're making, um, just grazing and letting everything go to seed all the time, we're gonna see increased diversity. And it is fair to say that we even, even though we've been doing it for about a year, uh, the first field that we started uh, mob grazing we've got a lot more diversity and already uh, birds foot trefoil you know all gone to seed red clover being allowed to go to seed now whereas when we had it you know shorter with uh, with sheep and and you know making hay in june or, or, or silage really i suppose it was in june um yeah that we, we didn't even know we had any well it certainly weren't anything going to seed so yeah it's, it seems to be getting better mm. I think I think the other thing is that your farm doesn't have to be managed in a monoculture approach. So we use different approaches on different fields, and it's really important that you're not sort of embracing doing everything in exactly the same way across your whole farm. So we've got a lot of hay rattle to the extent we wonder whether we're only growing hay rattle on some fields. But um, you know, there there are ways of encouraging um, hay rattle, and then hopefully the other species that that is a sort of indicator of. And we did wonder about going into hay, selling hay rattle seeds. Um, that was the level we were at. Um, so I think we found we're using, being very nuanced about the different fields and what they can offer to our farm. And that has helped a lot. So some areas we're focusing on high, what I call traditional meadow diversity. Others, it's about high diversity. Oh, there's someone waving there. It's very nice to see you there. Hi, little, this little, oh. um, so, um, but um, 
very so i think that's really important we've the one thing around um the other questions that have come up around herbal about floristic diversity has anyone got anything else they want to add about floristic diversity in their their meadows before i move back can to I, can i just say i think we've we haven't used um, compound fertilizer for 12 years and i think purely by managing it in a slightly different way and resting your fields longer before you put stock back in if you give the nature and you give the grasses and flowers and everything a chance to grow a lot of them just grow by themselves you know it just um I would like to encourage it more, but even by not encouraging it and just doing it in a way where you rest things, you do get more diversity. There's more plants, more flowers and stuff, like Sam said, that you didn't really know were there until you, you, you leave them the chance to grow, and they do just grow. Hopefully um, that helps. Yes, definitely. I'd echo that. Um, in... Um, in terms of, I'm just looking, um, Tim, you've been putting some really useful stuff um, on around herbal lays. Do you want to add anything more about your experiences there with establishment? Yeah, hi, um, Yeah, I mean, I think I just it was really nice to say that um, with the comment about needing to plow to establish them, and uh, I don't believe in most cases that is necessary. Uh, in fact, if you've got a permanent pasture for this, this reason, it's productive. Um, you know, I wouldn't obviously recommend people uh, destroy their good diverse meadows and things like that. But if it's really dull sward and you want to improve it or have a range of different options on your farm for uh, for livestock, then I think. Uh, we, the bits we sprayed off and uh, direct drilled have worked as well as well better than uh, other areas where we've um, where we had to dis them and, uh, and drill them the broadcast. But, um, but I do think I agree with Nick that if you don't use glyphosate to um, say just kill off the existing sword, it's an uphill struggle to get those species in. Uh, even the productive um, agricultural varieties are hard to get in, but although we have got some overseeding uh, demonstrations as well, which is um, hard to say how it's going to do. I think next year we'll have a better idea of what's survived and what hasn't. But don't be afraid of direct drills. They're available, um, well, certainly if they're available in Cumbria, I'd imagine they're available most places. Um, and the, the, the more unit drill is the one that we use. And, uh, I highly recommend it, but you do need to make sure your preparation is really good like any any sowing of any uh, crop of any sort uh, preparation is actually key so it's a very short sword before you before you do it uh, main thing and obviously good soil conditions it was so dry this spring that we just delayed and delayed until until we had some moisture and then waited a bit for the new more moisture was coming and then uh, to be honest they couldn't have been a really good growing season since then and they've been it's growing incredibly well but it's only, it's only our first year of growing them so I'm, I'm no expert well it's it's good to hear tim and certainly for those who aren't organic that's an option to consider clearly for those of us who are organic it's it's not an option um so it'd be interesting to know if anyone organic farmers have had uh, uh, good experiences we we moved from an arable crop and did did plow because it were the arable crops but um i certainly would echo not plowing up a good pasture um so we're all all learning as we go along. I'm just conscious of time and um, we currently have four minutes left. Um, has anybody, I, well, I've tried to keep an eye on the chat. There's, um, there's one question I might come back to to finish on, but um, anybody else got anything they'd really like to raise or ask any of our panel? Uh, Mark? So I was just waving at the little girl who's Oh, I see. Alice. Okay, yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> Terribly cute. Yeah, we're all... <laughs> um, one thing is around, it's around costs, and I think this is something for us all to think about. Um, you know, quite rightly, we've spoken on profitability. Then the question is, is what about the end price? And, and are we 
Um, and uh, I also, with another hat, I, I chair, I'm chair of the Cumbria Inquiry, the Food, Farming and Countryside Commission. And it's very much how do we, if we think pasture fed livestock is the best, healthiest form of meat that people can eat, then um, how do we make that as available to as many people as possible? And if we're saying it's a niche product that is expensive, how does that tie in with the issues of social justice and access to food? So I think that's a note where we would um, need, to, you know, need to to think through that and and the pricing and how um, we encourage people to pay appropriately if their food. Farmers are properly rewarded, but at the same time, food is available, and it's a complex conversation. But it's something, um, you know, I think it's a, perhaps a note for us to um, think about as we move move forward. Um, on that um so it's it's a challenge there um we have two minutes if anybody has any particular um answers to that slightly wicked problem i'd be delighted to have them either i would say on a postcard in the chat or if anybody wants to say anything right now that would be lovely julia can i just say i, I think yeah. done um you can grow um meat on grass possibly cheaper if you if if you if you do it in a very streamlined way uh, I, I think i think we assume that pfla means it's going to be more expensive when actually if it's if if you're on it you can probably do it cheaper so i, I don't think it is necessarily always got to be much much more expensive mm. yeah i think also julia um I think the, the reality of price is very farm specific. And if you're, if you're a big farm, you could probably produce slightly cheaper than if you're a smallholder. And I think that's always going to have to be reflected in the type of route to market that that farm chooses and the type of customer that they're selling into. <clears throat> so it's probably not as simple as saying pasture for life equals more expensive or cheaper. It's, it's yeah. very bespoke. Bespoke. Um, Johnny, you've got your hand up. Would you like to come in? I was just going to say that, um, uh, to echo that, that yes, it is very farmer specific, but also uh, any farm that's doing it right and is able to command a higher price shouldn't be embarrassed by that. Um, that it's okay to make a good profit from um, doing what's right. Uh, and congratulations if you can. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Um, Great, that, that's excellent. On that note, um, we're exactly at three o'clock and really keen to keep these sessions running on time. I'd like to say a huge thanks to the Northern Real Farming Conference for running this conference over these couple of weeks. It's it's enormous uh, um, opportunity for those of us to meet with a whole range of other people. And um, so thanks to Rachel for, for being our tech support today. I know Rod's put a lot of, you know, I was in a breakout group with him, a lot, him and a huge team of people have put together a lot of effort making this happen, bringing it online. And um, also for PFLA, thanks to all our members for their continuing support. Do join up, go to our website, have a look. Um, and um, if you would, uh, um, and thanks to our funders that are, are making it possible for us to do the work we're doing. Um, and finally, a big thank you to our speakers. So to Sam, um, to Gary, to Nick and to Danny. Thanks for joining us today and for, for Jimmy keeping us all um, on message. I hope I've <laughs> said the right thing. <laughs> Thanks, Julia. It's been great. OK, have a very good rest of the conference, everybody, and a good weekend. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye-bye.